Hello, my name is Jonas Wagner. With this talk, I would like to present to you some of the work I did during the course of my PhD at the Dependable Systems Lab at EPFL. The work is titled Elastic Program Transformations, Automatically Optimizing the Reliability Performance Trade-off in System Software. <laughs> now, that's quite a mouthful, so when my friends ask me what I do, I tell them that I build tools that help reduce the number of bugs in computer programs. Bugs can be really annoying. We sometimes see their direct consequences. For example, when software crashes and we get a crash dialog, like this one. Some of you might remember the famous blue screens produced by Microsoft Windows when there was a software bug, or their more modern version that require you to restart your computer and probably mean that you've lost some work. More often than that, we see the indirect consequences of bugs. For example, bugs are one of the reasons we have so frequent software updates. We spend time searching for updates, and we spend time rebooting our computers once the updates are done. And just overall, bugs make us lose a lot of time and effort. Every once in a while, um, a software bug makes headlines around the world. For example, here's a screenshot of the WannaCry malware that spread this year in August using a bug in the Microsoft Windows operating system. So exploiting the bug allowed it to transfer itself from one computer to the next and uh, infect the computers of many people. So the goal of the work that I did during my PhD is to reduce the number of bugs so that we can avoid annoyances like the one we've seen. The technique that I use to achieve this is called elastic program transformations. And in this talk, I'm going to explain to you what elastic program transformations are. I will do this using three parts. First, I will examine the story of one particularly famous bug called Heartbeat. Because not everybody um, watching this video might know what a software bug is and how it works. And it's important to understand this before we can see how we eliminate bugs. I will then present two techniques that I've developed during the course of my PhD. One technique to protect software against bugs. This technique is called ASAP. And then another technique to find bugs that we do not um, know about yet. This technique is called FUS. Let me start with the first section um, and let me present to you the heartbeat bug. Heartbeat is a software bug that was discovered about three years ago, and it affected a software called uh, OpenSSL. OpenSSL is what you use when you make a secure connection to a web server, and it runs on the server and handles all the crypto. Now, at the time the bug was detected, um, approximately one out of every six servers on the internet was vulnerable. And this meant that an attacker could connect to the server and read the server's secret data um, this included passwords and secret keys, and the attacker could get all this data that it should not ordinarily have access to. The consequences of this were quite dramatic. It meant, for example, that all the users had to change their passwords, and servers had to be updated, private keys had to be regenerated, and so on. I will explain to you how the heartbeat box works using uh, this comic, which is taken from a very smart web comic called XKCD. On this comic, you can see a user communicating with a server. And in the bubble here on top, you can see the memory of the server. In this memory, the server stores all the requests that it receives, and it then processes these requests to generate a reply. Now, the heartbeat bug um, was um, contained in one particular type of a request which is called a heartbeat request. For this request, um, the user can send some data to the server, in this case, the word bird, along with the length of this data. And the server will send the same data back to the user. The purpose of this request is for the user to verify that the server is still working correctly. Now, the interesting case, um, the one where the heartbeat bug Occurred was the case where the user sent a malformed message. And in that message, the length field did not correspond to the actual length of the data that the user was sending. 
What do you think should the server do in this case? Well, intuitively, the server should just detect that something is wrong and maybe show an error message to the user. However, in this case, the programmer just did not consider that something like that could happen. And so what the server did was faithfully copy um, the amount of data that the user expected and send it back to the user. Now, this data that was sent to the user included information from other requests and could contain things like user passwords or secret keys and other data that the attacker should not be allowed to read. Now, in my work, we helped solve these problems along two ways. The first is that I worked on protection mechanisms which can prevent this sort of data leak from happening even if there are bugs in software. The second point that I did is I built tools to test um, programs and come up with these unexpected types of inputs that might cause the prob program to do uh, bad things. And doing this would help developers to find these bugs in software that they don't know about yet. Now let's start with the first technique to protect programs against this type of data. The technique that I'm using is based on program transformations. And you can think of a program transformation as something that scans the program and replaces all operations of a given type with a no another operation. For example, one thing that the program does is allocate memory. This is an operation that happens whenever a new request is received and um, the server uses it to reserve some part of its RAM in order to process the request. When we um, transform this memory allocation, we do it in a way that adds a little bit of unused memory space before and after this uh, memory that the server requested. When we do this, the memory of the server will now contain uh, consist of parts that the server uses to do its work, and also parts that are unused and that the server should never touch. By itself, this transformation does not yet allow us to protect the server, but we can now distinguish correct executions from incorrect executions. Namely, correct executions never touch these unused parts of memory, but incorrect executions might do that. In order to now detect these incorrect executions, the memory allocator keeps track of which areas in memory the server is allowed to use or not. It maintains a set of tags that, um, that show store for every address in memory whether the server may allow, is allowed to access it, in which case the tag is green, or not, in which case the tag is red. Then um, we use a second program transformation to modify every memory access in the program. Instead of just accessing a certain memory location, the program will now first compute the address of the tag that corresponds to this memory location. Then the program will read the tag and verify whether the program is allowed to access that memory area or not. If it's not allowed to access that area, it will print an error message and abort the program. And only in the other case will it proceed to access the memory area. The good thing about this transformation is that a server can now detect cases where it reads too much memory due to a bug. And it will, in this case, simply abort and show an error message to the user so that the attacker cannot read the secret memory of the server. In order to use such program transformations, um, developers only have to do a very easy thing. They program their program as, us as they usually would, which means writing program in a programming language like C. Then they compile this program, meaning they use a compiler to transform the source code into an executable version of the program. This executable version is what they install on the server. In order to use program transformations, um, the developer can activate a special option in the compiler so that the compiler, while it translates the program, can add these extra checks that protect the program from harm. 
As I said, these checks have the good effect of detecting errors and aborting the program in this case, but they also have a bad effect, which is that they slow down the program. I've shown in this graph the time it takes to process a request. And 100% here corresponds to the time that an unprotected server would take to process that request. Now the transformed server needs a bit more time first to manage all these tags in memory. Second, it needs more time to perform the actual checks. And the result is that programs get about 70% slower on average than they would otherwise be if they were not protected. Now to make an analogy, um, you could say to me, this would mean that my talk, instead of lasting half an hour, would now last over um, 45 minutes. In my work, we solve this problem of overhead, which is the reason why a lot of people would not use these program transformations. And our solution gives developers the ability to specify a budget. Developers can now say um, how much overhead they are willing to invest into protection mechanisms. To continue the analogy from before, you could say, for example, Jonas, it's not okay if your talk lasts 50 minutes, but you may take, let's say, 33 minutes until you need to finish. Our technique, which we call ASAP, takes this budget into account and generates a program that contains just part of the protections that um, the completely protected version contains. And in fact, it is the part that makes the program as secure as possible for the given overhead budget specified by the user. The reason that this works so well is a principle called the Pareto Principle. It was discovered by uh, Wilfredo Pareto, the person you see on the right, and formulated by Joseph Duran. And the principle says that 20% of effort often gives 80% of the result. In our case, this means that even with a small budget, we can protect most parts of a program. And I'm going to explain now why this is the case. To understand this, you have to understand the concept of hot versus cold. Let me make an example. When I was a kid, my parents told me that I should always wash my hands before eating. You can think of this as a program transformation, or rather a life transformation, which transforms the eat operation into the operation that says, wash hands, then eat. The cost of this transformation is about three minutes per day that I spend washing my hand. Now, consider if my parents had told me, Jonas, you should wash your hands um, after you touch anything. It is the same transformation. We just add hand washing to a couple of operations. But now the cost is much higher because I touch things very frequently, and so I would spend most of my day washing hands instead of doing useful work. We call operations that are um, executed rarely cold, and operations that are executed frequently hot operations. When we translate this to uh, um, security checks in software, we can consider this server that runs the vulnerable OpenSSL code. In OpenSSL, there are about 52,000 instructions that access memory and that could be protected using checks. Now, about 49,000 of these are executed rarely. This is the vast majority, but protecting it only costs about 1% of the full cost for checks. On the other hand, there are about 3,000 operations that are frequently executed, and protecting them requires a lot of um, CPU time and has a high cost. This is the same cut hold dis hot distinction that we have seen earlier in the hand washing example. Now, what our technique ASAP does is it analyzes these checks and classifies them as either hot or cold, and it keeps only the ones that are cheap or cold. And the promise is that if Mr. Pareto is right, this will lead to a program that has a high degree of protection, but low overhead. 
I would now like to explain a bit the technical part behind this work, and I will show you how we classify checks as either for the code. ASAP does this using yet another program transformation. The result of that program transformation is a table like you can see here. This table essentially specifies for each part of the program how often it is executed. In other words, it measures which part in the program are hot versus which are cold. We obtain this table using a program transformation. Consider here a part of the program that performs some computation. We transform this part so that in addition to performing the computation, it also updates a um, counter that counts how often the part was executed. Like this. Using this mechanism, we can now um, take the server and feed it feed to it some training data, some training inputs that will cause parts of the server to be executed and lead to a table like we see here that shows for every part how often it was used during training. With this data, our technique ASAP now computes for each of the checks a table like the following. The table contains all the operations that the check performs. And these operations are further broken down into individual instructions, like the ones that can be run by a CPU. ASAP knows for each of these instructions how many CPU cycles it takes, and it also knows from profiling how often each of these instructions was executed. And it can multiply these numbers to compute the amount of time, or rather the amount of CPU cycles, that have been used for each of these operations, and compute the total amount of CPU cycles required by this particular check. Based on the budget specified by the user, it will then classify that check as either hot or cold, and either keep it in the program or remove it. Let me now show you some of the results that this approach um, yields. The first question that I would like to answer is how many operations ASAP can protect? And to answer that question, I'm going to show you here the fraction of memory access operations in the program that are protected versus the overhead that is needed to protect these operations. We've measured this for a popular uh, benchmark suit called Spec Informix Benchmark, and we used a, um, an existing tool called Address Sanitizer to add checks to memory operations in these programs. With existing work, developers essentially have two choices. They can either choose to not protect their software at all, leading to a program that has no protection, but also no overhead. On the other hand, they can choose to use the tool as is and achieve a high level of protection, but also pay a high overhead. The dream for a programmer would be somewhere close to this um, lower right corner, where we have a high degree of protection, but low overhead. Now with our tool ASAP, developers can get a curve like this. This curve shows that really Mr. Pareto is right, and there's approximately 80% of the protection that has almost no cost. And there's only um, some checks that lead to a high rise in overhead. Now developers using our tool can choose any point on this curve according to their use case. For example, they could say that they can afford about 5% overhead. And in this case, our tool ASAP will tell them that it can protect 87% of the instructions in the program with memory safety checks. Now I've told you that um, this can help protect the program against vulnerabilities like heartbleed, but how much protection do we actually get using 87% of the checks? This is the question we answered in a second experiment. In this experiment, we looked at a software called FFMPG, which is a video decoder used, for example, when you go to YouTube to watch a video. Um, this software has um, a number of existing security vulnerabilities 
that we could reproduce, we reproduced 11 of these vulnerabilities shown here on the x-axis. And we measured again how much overhead is needed to protect the program against these vulnerabilities. The result looks like this. This curve shows that there, is, there are nine out of these 11 vulnerabilities that we can protect against at a very low overhead. On the other hand, if developers want complete protection and protect their program against all 11 vulnerabilities, they need to pay a much higher overhead cost. This means that ASAP gives developers flexibility, but it also comes at some risk. You no longer get full protection, but you get decent protection at low cost. In the last part of my talk, I would like to show you a second program, a second project that helps developers find bugs that they don't know about yet. I've shown you before that a bug um, arises due to an input that programmers did not expect. And in order to find bugs, we are going to generate such inputs, like the one that caused heartbeat. Now, one naive way to generate unexpected inputs is simply to send random data to the server. Unfortunately, sending purely random data like this does not test the program very well, because the server will simply reject it and tell the user, this is a bad request, I did not understand it, I'm not going to perform any work. However, there is a technique to generate more meaningful inputs, and it uses um, feedback from the program. This feedback um, comes from a program transformation that is very similar to the program transformation that I've shown you before. In fact, the type of feedback we use um, measures how often the server executed each of these parts while handling the request that the user sent. The idea is that we would take a request and perform small modifications, like replacing the letter X here by the letter E. This modification might lead to a different number of executions in some part of the program. And if we see this different number of executions, this signifies that the, the modification of the input was somehow interesting and somehow caused something to happen inside that software. If the testing technique sees this, it will continue modifying the input and further change um, parts of it in order to try to tickle the server in order to perform even more work. This process continues and um, using the feedback from these profile encounters can, lead, can gradually um, find inputs that exercise different behaviors in the server including, perhaps, behavior that the programmer did not think about, and that would lead to bugs. There's only um, one problem with this approach, namely that performing all these counting of executions is fairly slow. All these counters um, need CPU cycles of their own, and having them in the program, although it gives useful feedback, also slows things down and means that we can perform less tests in a given time. And this is the program that we solve using elastic instrumentation techniques. Our idea is to look at each of these counters and classify them as hot or cold in a way that's similar to what you've seen before. Our technique called FUS then um, attempts to keep only these counters that are cold, because these are counters that don't take up a lot of time, but give useful information to the testing process. Fast, uh, the, the result is that we can run tests faster, and we can still detect the interesting inputs. Um, in practice, the result looks like this. What you can see on this graph is the number of F executions over time, the number of different test inputs that have been tried. You can see this for both the original system, which is the red dashed line here, and our FAST system, 
which is the blue line. Um, the graph shows that initially both systems perform the same amount of work because they let the tests run for a moment until it is clear which counters are hot and cold. Fast then has a short amount of time during which it observes the testing process and classifies counters, and then an optimization phase where it um, removes these counters from the program that are too expensive. Once this is finished, the testing um, continues at a faster speed than before, and in fact, the, the number of tests that are being processed quickly surpasses the original system so that we can perform more tests in a given time and we can detect bugs more quickly than we could otherwise do. We've tested this on a number of benchmarks and in cases where it works well, we found that we can detect bugs up to three times faster using this technique. To summarize, I've introduced you to a concept of elasticity, which allows developers to use program transformations in a flexible way, choosing how much overhead they want to pay and how much benefit they get from the program transformation. I've shown you two applications of this. A first application called ASAP that protects programs against bugs at low overhead and a second application called FUS that uses these techniques to find bugs more quickly than traditional um, random testing techniques. With that, I thank you for your attention, and I hope that this presentation gave you an overview into the type of research that can be done at the Dependable Systems Lab in EPFL, and also gave you a sense that this elasticity is a useful concept that um, benefits everybody who uses program transformations.